You ever hear from Letterman since he retired? Yeah, he, we email each other once in a while. I don't know what he's he's I don't know what he's going to do with himself. You know. Well, that'd be a slight adjustment. Yeah, he's, he, you know, you know, I spent four years in the service. When you come out that first year, the acclimation to back in the civilian life after four years, because of the regimentation, he did 32 years. Yeah. Yeah. 32 years on a show. You, it's hard to break that. Yeah. You know, how do you, how do you do that, you know? He's going to drive his kid crazy. <laughs> yeah. He, he seemed very happy. You know, I, you, well, I'm watching him on TV. He never seemed, he always seemed like a kind of, I don't know, not sort of happy kind of guy. And then... He had a kid. Yeah. It seemed like his whole persona changed. I mean, on TV, I'd watch him. You're saying. absolutely right. You're yeah. absolutely right. You know, the problem, that when, if you're selling life insurance or you're selling magazines, that product is your brand. That's, that's what you talk about. You, you're obsessed on that because that's how you got to make a living. Yeah. In show business, we're the product. So guess what you talk about most of the time? Yourself, your show, me, 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 me. I mean, it's not, I don't mean that it's bad. It's just you have to. You're calling your agent. You're calling your manager. You're calling somebody. You're calling club owners <clears throat> and telling them that, look, my product is good, and you've got to use my product. And you, So we become sort of ob um, obsessed with our careers. A child is a diversion from there. You know, I, I, me having three kids was lucky for me. Also lucky for me, I spent four years in the military, and also lucky for me that I worked every odd, crummy job you could have before I became a comedian. But, and I love sports, so I would play softball and, and basketball, because you've got to have something to pull you away from this obsession about our brand all the time. Well, David, morning, noon, and night, was obsessed with his brand. He couldn't help it. You know, I mean, that's a show. You got, he'd get there early in the morning and sit there until late at night, but take all that away, you know. Besides... You guys know, 85% of all, this is my uh, humble opinion, 85% of all stand-up comedians, in my humble opinion, are insecure, neurotic, sometimes psychotic, loved, starved, wrecks. Yeah. Wrecks. Yeah. And the other 15% are gifted, confident people who say, I know how to write a joke, and I know how to tell one. I like to think I'm on the ladder, but never trust somebody who tells you they're sane. <laughs> <laughs> Like, what are you looking at? But, I, was, I was telling somebody. What are you looking at? The but if you insist he's, he's not crazy, is the craziest. He's craziest, that's right. Oh, you know, first of all, if, say you're not crazy. Say you're perfectly sane. When you come in our business, it'll make you crazy. You know, you're hot one night, you're not. They love you, they don't. Your option is up at the end of every joke. You know, most people live from day to day. Some people, singers live from song to song. A comedian, his option is up after every joke. You know, it's, it's, you're out every night in front of strangers. And essentially, you're saying, love me. They got to like you before they can laugh at you, you know, uh, and, and, and doing this. So, so it's, hey, if you're not that way when, when you start, you'll end up that way, <laughs> you know. It's, it's a wicked business. It's the greatest profession on the planet, bar none, stand-up comedy. <laughs> Why stand-up comedy is the greatest profession on the planet? And I'm going to digress for a minute. A man named Norman Cousins wrote a book called Laughter Math. He wrote another book called The Anatomy of an Illness. And in, in this man's life, he was in a hospital, had a heart condition. They told him he was going to die. And the doctors explained to him stress, stress, uh, and he didn't have long to live. And he thought, laying in a hospital, if negative input, stress, made me ill, then positive input should make me well. He checked out of the hospital, and he'd only watch I Love Lucy reruns, Candid Camera, Three Stooges, The Marx Brothers. He'd only listen to comedy albums. And then he literally laughed himself to health. He lived 27 years after the doctors told him he was going to die. Because of him... UCLA did research on what happens to the human body when, it, when a person laughs. We always have known that laughter is psychologically a deterrent because the brain can't think of two things at the same time. So if you're watching a comedian on stage laughing, you're not thinking of your problem. So it's a psychological deterrent. But now UCLA did this research that when the body, when, when you laugh, the brain releases endorphins into the bloodstream, which are chemicals that are actual healing agents. So that's why after a hearty laugh, after you've laughed so hard and tears are running down your eyes and you go, oh, the sense of well-being comes over you because your body's gone to an actual chemical change. So laughter is not only psychologically uplifting, it's physiologically deterrent. So we comedians are physicians of the soul. So you can refer to Dr. Bill Gorgo or Dr. James Wesley. Dr. You know, we really are physicians of the soul. That's why it's the greatest profession on this planet. We make people healthy. We make people feel better. You know, that's why I, whenever I talk to young comedians, I say, you're in the greatest profession on the planet. Don't tarnish it. I'll tell you how not to tarnish it. Don't talk bad about other comedians. Have you ever gone to a doctor and said, gee, I was thinking about going to Dr. Milroy. Have you ever heard a doctor say, Milroy? I wouldn't trust my, no. my snake with that. 
they have too much respect for their profession, as we should. You know, what we do, you know what we do. You know what we do night after night. You know, the struggle we've gone through, and yet with three people in the audience, we'll still get up there. Because maybe that one person needs this laugh more than, than we need the gig. You know, you'll never know. I know all of you could tell me a dozen stories. I've had them, people would come up to me and say, you don't know me, but one time I was calling the lawyer's office and the woman, the answering service, he's not in. I said, will you tell him please, Tom Dreesen called. She said, are you Tom Dreesen, the comedian? I said, yes. She said, my husband uh, died of cancer, uh, he blah, blah, blah. She said he was ill for six months and one night, she, he said, I can't, I don't want to stay in the house anymore. Let's go somewhere. And we went over to the comedy store and you were on and my husband laughed so hard that night. She said, and that's the last time I ever heard my husband laugh. And she said, so whenever I envision him, when I think of him, I think of that night because I want to remember him laughing. That's the power we have as comedians. That's the, the, the health that we bring to the world. So that's why it's such an important profession, you know, and why we shouldn't, you know, I, why I don't ever want to talk bad about another comedian. I, I sound like Will Rogers. I never met a comedian I didn't like on stage. I met a few off stage <laughs> that you say, I don't think I want to hang around with this person. But on stage, I'd always find something and say, well, that's funny or that's clever, you know. First of all, I loved comedians before I was one. I never thought I'd be a comedian, but before I was one, I thought, wow, can you imagine what they do? They go up there and, 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 and they make people laugh with, you know, I'll, I'll give you a, a great digress. Opening for Frank Sinatra. People will always say to me, what's that like? And I was on a show the other day, and, and the uh, host's name was Bill. And he said, uh, uh, what's it, what, what was it like opening for Frank Sinatra? I said, well, it was like this. There's 20,000 people in this arena. And just moments before you go on, you know, this is what you have to do. You've got to go out in front of 20,000 people, and you're in the center. And you've got to hold their attention for the next 45 minutes. Oh, one more thing. You've got to hold their attention, but you've got to make them laugh for the next 45 minutes. Oh, one more thing. You gotta hold their attention to make them laugh, but you gotta make them laugh when you want them to laugh. You gotta pull the strings and the emotions of 20,000 people. No props, no tricks, no charts, no special arrangement, no special lighting, no orchestra, nothing. Just you and 20,000 people. And one more thing, not one of them came to see you. That's, a, yeah. that's yeah. the thing I was thinking. Nobody's here that's to see so me. <laughs> does that, does that, does that yeah. sound like Mission Impossible, you know? Yeah. Totally. But, that's what we do. And that's why we have to have such respect for comedians, you know, for what they do, what they bring to our society. What other profession does that? What other profession brings joy and laughter and health and true health, you know? So, you know, uh, you're special people. And I'm, I'm proud that you're my friends.